on the occasion of this year's International Literacy Day, it is my uh, privilege and honor to certainly congratulate and extend our best wishes to all the prize winners, the literacy prize winners, and all the thousands and thousands of people who actually work tirelessly in improving the literacy among so many millions and millions of people. So thank you very much and best wishes. Talking about literacy in Maldives, I think a bit of historical uh, context is uh, necessary because Maldives has been an independent state for most of its history. It was occupied for only about 15 years in the 16th century. The Maldives then became a British protectorate in 1887 and remained so until its independence on 26th of July 1965. The Maldives converted to Islam in the middle of the 12th century. They were a Buddhist country before. This point I would like to emphasize in the context of literacy as well later on. Like many small island states, we have a scarcity of human resources along with other challenges. Just now we heard from a country with millions of people. Maldives population is only 300,000. I mentioned this in a conference before in India, and at the uh, break time, an Indian delegate came and told me, you know what? Your population is equivalent to a slightly crowded Indian bazaar. I said, yes, sir. So that, that's, that's the type of population we are dealing with. And that is, the, uh, uh, that is how the literacy challenge is. But the challenge for us is because this 300,000 population is widely dispersed, dispersed to around 200 islands in the middle of the Indian Ocean. That's the challenge we face. Maldives started on a major literacy campaign in 1980, when there was a change in government just before that. But even then, our literacy rate was, basic literacy rate was over 60%. Why did we have that literacy rate? I refer back to our uh, Islamic historical context. Because of the value that we have placed in imparting the knowledge that we had, and through the madrasas and through the learned scholars, Islamic scholars, they on their own have provided literacy or whatever basic literacy to the children in each of the island communities. Hence, this was able to increase the uh, basic literacy rate in the country. The current literacy rate is close to 98%. I don't think we should be complacent about the achievement uh, of that basic uh, number. But over the years, we have been able to achieve universal basic education and expand the early childhood education program as well. Now the challenge for us is to try and maintain that lit literacy rate and also increase the, uh, this to higher levels of literacy, especially among uh, uh, young people. We do not have a compulsory education act in the country, even today. But despite that, because of the historical context, we have been able to, people love, because of love for education, they have been able to impart this education uh, uh, to, to their children. But right now we are working on a compulsory education act and it is at the parliament stage. But until today, we do not, do not have that. Since the reconceptualization or redefinition of education policies over the last two decades, we have made a remark re remarkable progress in our education sector, in addition to the literacy. The early childhood ed education has been expanded, primary education has been universalized, and secondary education has, been, has seen marked growth, and it, is reached, it has uh, all children at secondary uh, age has access to uh, secondary education now. Despite this, we face numerous challenges in providing quality education and quality basic education in order to have a proper 
and proper higher education system in the country that we are trying to uh, forge ahead. It is important to note that only this year, early this year, that we were able to establish its first national university in the, in the country. The non-formal education system in the, in the country has been instrumental in achieving the high literacy rate that we have and also trying to maintain the high literacy rate that we have. As I said before, we have about 98% literacy and we have marginally higher literacy rate for females. Now the emphasis is on achieving the EFA goals and improve the quality. This is being achieved through decentralized, an emphasis on decentralized educational management. Until recently, it was highly centralized, trying to manage the whole system from the central capital where the population is so widely dispersed. But now we are trying uh, a decentralized educational management and also trying to provide well-rounded education at the uh, uh, island level. Our emphasis is on bringing about more inclusive education as well, with special emphasis on uh, special needs uh, uh, right throughout the country. Promoting gender equity is for us as a base, is a basic human right. It provides positive values and skills for personal and national development. It has, as we all know, multiple effects, empowering women to bring about other necessary changes uh, uh, investing more in family uh, activities. Historically, Maldives has never had a tradition of secluding women from public life. In fact, this, is, this has been, an Im it would have been impractical suggestion to even to do so, because traditionally, the traditional jobs required the men folk to, be, to spend their days, to spend their hours during the day most of the hours out in the sea, fishing. This meant that women took care of all the household activities, looked after their children, they engaged in community life, and, and in fact, they were instrumental in the economic activities after the fish were brought back to island. So women actually did the uh, uh, cleaning uh, uh, and uh, processing the fish as well. So Your women have been very active. You have two minutes more. Thank you. So women have been actively uh, engaged in the affairs of the community and children. So Maldivian society historically has shown, demonstrated a strong matrilineal heritage as well. The change, the, however, the change in current economic patterns that promote a cash economy has devalued women's worthwhile contribution in the past. And this is something that we are mindful of and we need to certainly encourage their uh, we need to bring them on board with their activities uh, and their contribution as well. Women's literacy and schooling is not simply about acquiring gender equity in order to share wealth. It is also not simply about investing in human capital through education of the self to generate wealth. Women are half of our labor force or half of, our, in fact, the world. So that's our half our human capital. In order to mobilize this capital, they require the basics for inclusive and sustainable development of any society. And we are focusing on, on their fuller participation in economic as well as social, uh, the transformation that we are going through. As you know, we have recently had uh, multi-party uh, democracy uh, parties uh, introduced, and women's participation at the political level is also encouraged. Well, before I, uh, before I conclude, uh, let me also uh, reiterate uh, and thank the government of India, in particular the Ministry of Human Resources Development for organizing and hosting this excellent conference. I thank the Indian hospitality. As usual, it has been generous, extremely generous. So I take this opportunity to thank the Indian government and the people of India for this conference and hosting us. Thank you very much. Thank you.